I'll say this again. Now, one of the reasons why Chapter 6, dealing with the normal curve, is complicated is because of the fact that um, you have to know the normal curve forwards and backwards. And I mean, and that's literally the truth. You have to be able to calculate z-scores and look up probabilities of which are considered areas for all pr practical purposes of what we're looking at. And I'll try to explain that as we go along. And then you have to find er have areas, get, be given areas, and then come up with a z-score. All right, so what I've got here first is um, just a kind of a very simple way to look at area first. And most people know about area. We're not going to really discuss this in length, but I just wanted to kind of tie this to something um, familiar about area. Most people know about area from geometry. When you're talking about a rectangle, you find the length, you find the width, and you multiply. Well, this is what's called a uniform distribution. And as I said, you don't have to really get into the technical aspects of what we're dealing with here. I just want you to see how area works to just refresh your memory. But what we have on um, the horizontal scale is voltage. And you can see that each one of the tick marks is about half of a unit. It starts at 123 and goes up to 125. So each one of those four half units makes a, a total length along that or a total distance along that horizontal axis is two. Now, on the um, vertical axis, we're dealing with P of X, which is probability. And you'll see that it goes up to 0.5. And so, believe it or not, 0.5 times 2 is 1. So that's why this rectangle, the whole thing, not just a little small area, represents probability because the total probabilities can add up to is 1. Can't have a probability greater than one. So for the little red area, um, along the vertical axis, which is now the length, we've got that same distance of 0.5. But if we're just looking at that little red area, we're going from 0.5 to 1.25, which is 0.5. And that's where they get the 0.5 times 0.5. So that gives us an area of 0.25 or one quarter. So essentially what this is just saying is there's a one quarter chance that the, that the voltages for this little um, schematic will fall in that range. And you can kind of see that that's more or less true because that little red area is one quarter of the distance of the whole thing. If you were to take four, uh, four, uh, three more of those and put them side by side, you would fill up that whole white box. But anyway, we're not going to be concerned about that very much. But we want to go back to the empirical rule. If you're still having trouble with the empirical rule, you might check out that little video. But we're mainly talking about normally distributed data. And normally distributed data is what the chapter three folks call, or the chapter three usually called it approximately symmetric. All right. They even uh, brought up the term bell curve shaped. And that's also true. It's just not the formal name. The formal name is uh, normally distributed data, meaning that it looks like this. And if it looks like this, just to review the pure empirical rule, that we know that if we go one standard deviation on either side of the mean, then that's about 68%. And notice it's the squiggly little equal sign, so that means approximately. If we go out two standard deviations, that's 95%. And that's going to be important. We'll hit on that just a little bit towards the end about that 95% thing. 95% is a very important um, percentage in statistics. And you've already learned a little bit about it. Because when something is unusual, it's outside 95%, meaning that it's in the 5%. So when you get less than 5%, that's why we call it unusual. And then if you go three standard deviations for all intents and purposes, you get what was called nearly all the data. 
Now, here's the first time you actually get to see that it's 99.7, which is entirely nearly all. If you had 99.7% of something, you know, you could just not find about the remaining 0.3%. But the point is, is that once you go beyond th uh, three standard deviations in each, either direction, there is a tiny bit and it's 0.3% on either side over there. Now, <clears throat> to try to scare you a minute, and uh, th this formula right here is how you calculate it. Well, let me just back up. We may not want to know necessarily these nice even standard deviations. Suppose we wanted to know a standard deviation of 2.3 or negative two, uh, 1.7. Well, you can't really use the empirical for rule for that. So that's why what this formula does is given any value or um, standard deviation, we could calculate this out and find out what the area is to the left of that. Now, thankfully, you don't have to worry about this because this thing right here is or, um, can be done through technology. There are tables in the book. The technology is always um, more accurate than the, the tables in the book. The tables in the book are the old ways. That was back when uh, there were computers to calculate them, but um, usually they weren't in the classroom. So what you would they do is put um, tables in the book and their um, approximate values. Now I'm gonna kind of show you some ways to do these things where we're gonna go to the technology and do it. The calculator, in my opinion, goes overboard and in, in, in oh, let me back up again. The helps or the examples in the connect, in my uh, estimation, go a little bit too far in trying to show you how to do everything via the calculator. What I'm going to do is show you how to use the calculator to bring back areas from Z values and then from Z values bring back areas and then we'll kind of do the other things by hand and if you do it that way it's not too bad but if you're relying on the helps you know good luck to you I'll try to help you but I think uh, when you get into the calculator too much it's, it can be just a little bit um, I don't know how to put this you have to have an alternate way to do things. There's nothing wrong with using the calculator, but I like to get into the theory of it and show you why it happens. Use and get the basic cal uh, things that you couldn't do by hand or take you a long time to do by hand with the calculator, then bring things back and do other things pretty quickly. Incidentally, there's a little story about this that this thing's kind of special to me in a way because when I was in graduate school, I took a statistics course and uh, like oftentimes with students, I would ignore things. And I remember uh, the teacher assigned uh, a homework to take the derivative of this thing, which I know that a couple of y'all told me about taking calculus. But you know, if you'd have taken that, you know what the derivative is. Anyway, it's a pain in the neck, and I didn't do it. And I he'd never heard more about it during the class, so I thought I was home free and then at the end of the when you finished all your coursework you take an exam and there were like two or three questions from every course and one of the questions of course was take the direct <laughs> and actually I actually figured it out you know on the day of the test which I thought that was a good thing then never did have thought I could have done something like that now now uh, there's supposed to be a, a picture in here. I don't know why it's, uh, I don't know if it's just too much. Too much memory, what? But um, the point of that, and I'll just kind of show it over here. This is the one that I had. See if it'll let me just copy and paste it in there again. I know it's already in there. Like I said, I think it's probably just a matter of memory. It's too much stuff to display. But the normal curve um, can have various shapes and yet still be normal. They don't all have to be, um, for a matter, as a matter of fact, if you go back up to this one, 
this one is mean of zero and standard deviation of one. But not all data is like that. They can take on different shapes, like the red one is the one that we just looked up there with a the normal curve. Uh, you can see that uh, orange or yellow looking one is real flat. And that one has a different standard deviation and mean. The blue one is real tall and skinny. It has um, mean of zero, but the standard deviation is really high. It's five. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're just that approximately symmetric. If they're that approximately symmetric, then we can rely on the basic rules of probability, which you thought were completely useless. Now, if you still um, fretting over probability, as long as you understand the basics of probability, then that's all you really need to know here. You need to understand those basic rules of how probability works, that it's always a number between zero and one. Can't be outside of those boundaries. And also, too, the green one over here has a different mean, and, a sh and it also has a short standard deviation. But what we can all do is use the z-score, and the z-score allows it to be um, like the red one. And then from that, we can do calculations and find areas. So everything underneath there is going to be equal to one, no matter which one it is, fat or skinny. All the fat or the skinny means is the standard deviation is changing. For that um, that yellow orange one, that's got a big standard deviation. For the blue one, it's got a small or standard deviation. So the complement rule is the one that we're going to be using the most here because everything in there has to add up to one underneath that curve because that curve, that area, represents probability. Now, there's three different scenarios, just like things in Chapter 3 and Chapter 5 in that you got a less than, you got a greater than, and you got a between, all right? So uh, thankfully, with the uh, um, normal distribution, you don't have to worry about less than or equal to or greater than or equal to because the equal to doesn't really add anything because when you look at it, that area underneath there, there's an infinite number of values, believe it or not. And so adding in the equal essentially adds nothing to the mix. So we don't have to worry about less than and less than and equal to. So if uh, if that was something you struggled with in Chapter 5 or was the last place we did that, and I think that's where we spent the most time on it, then, you know, you're not, you're not any less for the wear, okay? Now, the first scenario is the probability of x less than some value. We call it a here. All right, and what that essentially means is we, if we have a z-score, we can find out the area to the left of that z-score, and that tells us what we want it to know. X says uh, here, example, assume the randomly selected sub that a randomly selected subject is given a bone density test. These tests are normally distributed, that's important, and as is also the randomly selected, okay? The randomly selected is throughout the book, you're always gonna assume that. For the uh, chapter three, the Chevichev inequality, you had some where you didn't know the normally distributed, but for the most part uh, in this course, um, you wanna know normal distribution. If you get into, um, when we get into chapter seven and eight, there's going to be uh, a couple of different scenarios. You may not, if you don't know if it's normally distributed, you, you have to check for a norm, uh, normality. And we'll look at that before we leave today about how to assess normality. I think you already know most of it. And then um, uh, also when the um, sample size is really large above 30, we don't have to worry about it either. We can assume normality. All right. So what we'll want to do is just right here, see they've got, we got a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, meaning that this right here, if we just look up that z-score, that's what's going to tell us how many 
um, how, what area is to the left of x. In other words, play like x is negative 1.23, then what is that purple area? And remember, everything underneath there's one, but we got to find out what that little chunk is. All right, now, um, this is a, the table that's in the book. I mean, you're free to use, I'm not in the book, it's in the um, Canvas modules. And this is formally the review sheet that um, you use for the exam. It was made for that. Now, of course, the issue is um, when we went to these kind of, Corona classes, the exam that they created, they didn't even need to have this because they put the formulas in the in the exam. So, uh, but anyway. So this is a table, like I said, it's kind of more old fashioned. It is fairly accurate, but I'm gonna show you this and I'll show you the calculator. So what we wanna look for is that negative 1.23, and the way this works is the left table, there's two tables here. The left is negative values going all the way up to the middle right there at mean, which would be 50%, 0. 0.5. And I wish I could select these, but it won't let me do that. Sometimes it lets me, but on some of these PDFs. And then this other half starts at 0. 0.5, as you can see up here, and it'll go out to almost one. See, in this one, it doesn't quite get down to zero because, like I said, is there's always a little bit left no matter how far to the left you go. But anyway, negative 0.123, the, the way this table works is you look up for the first two digits. You look up for the whole uh, number and then the tens. And you've got to match up the sign. So negative 1.2 is right here. So this is the row we want. We've determined the row. Now, how do we determine the column? Well, if it's just negative 1.2, then this is it, the first column. And then you start adding 100 as you go across. So it's 1, 2, 3, the fourth column, because that's the point 0.3. So uh, point 0.1093, oh, So that's about 11% of the data About 11% of the data is to the left of negative 1.23. Now that little um, drawing is kind of uh, just a, um, it's kind of a, it's not specifically for negative 1.23, so it may not quite be um, proportional. But anyway, that's the idea. All right, so let's look at that calculator calculator is pretty easy and I want to show you my method of using the calculator to make it less confusing but if you get into those examples that they have on the connect math uh, they take you into to the full usage of the calculator which I think is quite you know as can be more confusing so I'm just going to show you how to do it by hand and only use the calculator to bring back the values that are too hard to calculate by hand. All right, so here's your calculator. All right, now remember for chapter five, section two, we use the thing called the second VARS, which brings up this D-I-S-T-R, I'm not sure, well, I do know what it means. It means distributions, and there's a lot of different distributions. We don't get into all of them. Remember, we looked at the one down here, the A and B, which is the 11th and the 12th one. But there's a lot more of things that you don't have to worry about. Um, I don't know what number one could be used for. That, to me, doesn't make any sense, but... Uh, the two is what you want. Make sure you always use this one. It's the normal CDF. So unlike chapter five, where you use a binome PDF, you will always use norm CDF here, okay?
and then hopefully that um, you'll understand for the reason for that, and then hopefully it'll help you uh, take some of the pressure off to, to off of you that there's not that much to uh, deal with here as it was in chapter five. All right, so. Um, Anyway, press on the enter. And if you've got this one, the TI-84 Plus, hopefully you got this kind of um, the way you're able to input it. It prompts you for the things. There are some, if they're not the exact same um, model, you'll have to kind of remember this order and put a comma in between these things. And you can get the... Um, you know, go to the internet and do a search and if you need more help on it. Like I said, because the, the instructions are geared towards one particular um, in the book and for me, you're gonna be um, pertain to one particular model of calculator. All right, so. This right here should always be there especially the way I'm going to tell you to do it. That first one, it says lower, and it says negative 1, e to the 99. And I know last week when we were talking about um, scientific notation, so people had questions about this, but that's what that is. That's negative 1 exponent to the 99. That's a fancy way of saying negative infinity. And if you're going to do, especially a, a to the left, that should always be there. If you have to put it in, you have to use the exponent button to put in that E. That's not a normal E. And this is why I highly suggest you not be experimental with a calculator unless you understand exactly what you're doing. Because if you put a regular E in there, and this is why I, I dis, dislike calculators, especially the TI. If you put a regular E in there, it won't give you an error. <laughs> It'll give you back a value that, you know, I cannot understand how they get it, but it's, it be, won't be the right value that you get back. So hopefully if yours is like this, that it's set up to where it's always in there, leave it in there. All right. Now, the upper value is just going to be that negative. 1.23 and you have to use the negative sign all right the one down there at the bottom uh, opposite uh, the zero next to the decimal okay mm. now you can leave all these other things the same the only thing you're filling in hopefully is that negative one two three and hit enter several times and look at that that's the same value that came back from the uh um, the table, the only thing is this is more accurate because it goes out instead of to four, it goes five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten decimal places. Okay. So that's the area to the left of negative 1.26. I'm sorry, negative 1.23. Any questions about that? All right. Um, hmm. Must be like allergies or something I'm having these last few days. It's like, uh. So, let's go back to those notes and look at now the second way of, or the second scenario. Make that bold. Make this bold. All right. See how this is different? It's now no longer less than. It's greater than. And notice that the area that's shaded is on the opposite side. Well, what this means is you use the complement rule. You can get the calculator to do the greater than for you in one step, but I'm going to show you using the complement rule. Like I said, you're kind of on your own there. And then the sad part is, I think the instructions will um, take you through that procedure to do it. And if you learn it, that's fine. But like I said, is this is a safe way to do it. 
So to find this area, what we're going to do is essentially do what we just did in the previous problem. We, uh, the z value is down here. It's 0.23. It's just that it's not fitting on here. Let's see the other one. I was hoping to have it all on one page, but it doesn't look like it's going to work. So what we're going to do is do the same thing, and uh, we would essentially find out what that white area is. In order to find out what the blue area is, we use the complement rule. We subtract the area we get back from the table or from the uh, calculator, or any technology for that matter, and subtract from one. So uh, find the area of the shaded area. The graph depicts the standard normal distribution of bone density scores with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. All right. Standard deviation is one and mean of zero means that what this is is a Z score. If you don't have a mean and standard deviation of one, you'll have an X value and have to calculate the Z score by hand. We'll look at that next. So now. Um, you can do this with the textbook, you, a table. You can do it with the uh, a calculator. But let's just look at this again with the calculator just so you can get the hang of uh, <clears throat> bringing those values back with that calculator in case you didn't get it the first time. All right, so it's the same thing. So if you didn't get it the first time, normal CDF, first of all, the second vars which is the distributions go to the second one and now um for here we're going to put in 0 0.23 leave the other ones alone 0 0.59095 now you can kind of think about this to kind of help you uh figure this out Make sure you're on the right track. But uh, we'd said that it was 0 0.95, uh, I'm sorry, 0.59, so it's almost 60. So you can kind of see that that white area is roughly that. But we're not finished because what we got to do is we got to take that 0 0.59 and subtract it from 1. And that gives us the 41, or 0 0.40905, which is roughly 41%. And so that would be the area of the blue, all right? Because it's to the right. Questions about that one? How, um, hey, Mr. Cruz. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you know to... Um, like, how did you know that for just this problem? Like, why didn't we do that for the problem above? Is it like because, wording? Because of this. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Can you see that? The yes. greater than. Okay. Okay. They even say, and they say in the problem, greater. Okay. Now, the other one said less. There's several different ways to do it. You can say, um, for the first one, it was less than. It could be to the left. Because that's what the um, that's what that is when you're talking about to the left. That's less than, you know, it's like a number line. So on this one, we say when we say greater than, you could also say more than. You could say to the right. Um, there's a couple of different ways to say it. Then when we've got that one, when we got the greater than, the more than, with the arrow pointing to the right, that's when we have to use the complement rule. Now. As I had said, I'm going to go over here um, and just show you again because I know some of y'all will take this route, and I'm just I'm not going to get into an explanation of it because uh, I'm not doing a TI calculator class anyway. And then I'll just give, tell you this: you can swap. The lower and the upper around. In other words, you could have put 0 0.23, and then the upper, you would put 
a one e to the nine nine and then that would take care of it for you but you got to remember like i said is that e is not the normal e so that's why i'm leaving this always as it is because um it's to save confusion also it's got to be positive over there and infinity on that side is positive all right so it will do it like i guess it i'm just not uh going to take you through all of that because it's too specific to just a calculator. I'm trying to give you the theory behind it. All right. Now, the last situation, and this is the same thing kind of we had in 5.2, is a between. In other words, it's written like this. A is less than X is less than B, a fancy way of saying but it's between two values. All right. Now, with this, you essentially got to look up two Z scores, two Z scores, and then subtract the difference because this is how it works is if we look up everything from one all the way over, we're going to have uh, an, a value that's. Um, You know, one value, and then if you look up the negative one, you're going to have a smaller value, and then to find out in between is you subtract the smaller value from the larger value. So let's try that. We want to find the area in between 1.28 and negative 0.86. Now I went ahead and already took. Uh, I've already um, found the values, the, um, the area that pertains to everything to the right, not just the blue area, but everything all the way over to negative infinity is 0.899727. And then this little white area, in other words, to the left of negative 0.86 is 0.1984. So if we want to find out that area in between, we're simply going to go and chop this part off, that little white part to the left. And then what remains is what is in that blue area. So when we do that, that blue area is 0 0.70483, or that's about 70% of the entire area under the curve. You can also get the calculator, and this is a lot easier with the calculator. It's just that if you take out um, on this one, you got to put back um, that in, in, you know, the infinity thing. But you can put the lower and the upper boundary uh, on there, the negative 0.86 and the um, 1.28, and you'll get this in one swoop if you want. Okay. All right, let's do this again, except we're going to have one little extra thing to do, which is we've got to calculate a Z value, because with these, they gave you um, Z values already. So as I had said earlier when I showed you those different shapes of those graphs, uh, not every data set has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So in order to do this, you use the Z score formula. And we'll just uh, rec uh, kind of uh, refresh our memory about the z-score formula. This is really one of those things that statistics is very, uh, you know, powerful and very important because you see z-scores all the time. Most everything that you deal with in statistics, in this class especially, deals with z-scores. That doesn't necessarily mean you always have to calculate them, but we want to have z-scores that are relative to other z-scores and put things on the same s a scale. So the way the z-score works is you take a data value, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. And that will put, put it in relative um, terms of where it is on that curve.
and the z-score um, is going to be used here because we're told that IQ students of adults are normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 50. See, there's some difference now. There's no uh, 0 and 1. It's 100 and 100 and uh, I'm sorry, and 115 for the two values given. Now, what we need to find out is the probability of selecting an individual with an IQ score of less than 119. Now, notice this is just like that first scenario where it's less than, okay? Less than. Could maybe say fewer. All right. Now, what we're going to do is just calculate the z-score. So let's go ahead and just do this on the board. Let's see, how is the problem worded? Okay, so we want to um, find the probability of selecting a random individual with IQ less than 119. And as I said, probability is the same thing as proportion or relative frequency, and it's also now um, area, okay? That area underneath that curve relates to all of those things. So when we want to find the probability of selecting the random individual, we're essentially going to just find that area underneath. But first of all, we need to calculate the z-score. All right, so I'm just going to do that by hand. Um, and for those of y'all that figure it out, you can actually do this. Uh, you can do everything with the calculator, but it'll bypass the z-score. And so if you need that as an intermediate step, then you got to go back and calculate by hand anyway. You could just put in um, the mean of 100, standard deviation of 15, and then put in 119 as your value. But like I said, is uh, there are some of the problems that are going to ask you what the z-score is. So then you got to do it by hand anyway. So it was 15, wasn't it? Okay. So that means 19 over 15, and I'll just do that with, uh, over here on the calculator, out of your view, 19, uh, what's going on? So that's a 1.27. All right. So again, I want to go to the calculator. I'll do it one more time here, just in case you haven't gotten it yet. Now, the good thing of getting it, of getting the calculator to do everything is it would keep all this accuracy, but um, we're not going to be that accurate. So that's 0 0.8979, 
six. And just if you haven't figured this out yet, if you're asked in the problem to round off your answer to four decimal places, you don't want to round off before you get to your final answer. You're always going to want to go a couple of decimal places beyond and then only round out at the end because of the fact that if you round off first, then you've lost your accuracy. You'll never get it back. So the area to the left. What did I say it was? Eight, nine, seven, nine, six. Oops, I messed something up. Eight. So uh, it's almost 90% if you round it off to... Um, Three, uh, two significant digits, then it would be about 90%. Thus, I'm just going to try to humanize it for you. So that's the proportion, and proportion is essentially probability, okay? So therefore, if, if, the, if the people in your pool are in proportion, that proportion, then when you go in and select one, you got a 90% chance or a 0.9% chance of finding someone with a score less than 119. All right, questions? So we did the same thing as we did in that first problem. We just had to calculate a z-score. I'm just going to... Uh... put the fine because we're going to still, still be using that data. So what's the difference here between this one and the other one? The wording might have also said instead of greater than, it might have said more than. All right. So that just means we got to use the complement rule once we do this. But we still have to calculate the z-score. And I just put that there just to remind me what it is even though you got this here to show you what it is, but. So 81 minus uh, 100 is negative 19. So this one ends up being negative 1.27. All right, now um, I'm going to go ahead and do this off screen real quick. Same thing, the two, normal CDF, and then I'm going to change it to negative 1.27. Now, the, the reason why I got this one here is just so you can see the, how symmetry works. So... Um, The area to the left one oh two oh four. So we got to subtract that now. And what do you think we're going to come out to? So 
So this is also uh, showing you how the uh, complement works. It ends up being the same thing because of the fact that we're dealing with symmetry. So about 90% Okay. Okay, the third scenario. Using the same information. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is a different one. I'll start a new page. This is a kind of a standalone. All right, an engineer designs an ejection seed for an airplane. The pilots have a randomly distributed population with a mean of 128 and a standard deviation of 29.4. So this was gonna, like, nearly is gonna be as neat because the values are a little bit different than that and the standard deviation is a decimal. If a, si a pilot is randomly selected, find the probability the pilot has a weight between 120 and 160. One. So the key word here is between. So we're essentially going to do the same thing. Before we did in that third scenario, except we got to have two Z scores. And I'm just going to do it off um, camera. You tell me if I'm right. So one six one. Oops, whoops. No, that's right. One six one minus one twenty eight. And then that's going to be thirty three. Now, one of the drawbacks of doing it by calculator, and this is why, like I said, is you almost need a calculator course in order to do it. But um, if you were to try to put this on the calculator to calculate a z-score, you gotta do you gotta uh, use parentheses around that numerator, or else the division uh, won't occur correctly. This is why I do it by hand. Because if I have to fiddle with putting parentheses into the calculator and all that, and I might as well just do this. So this is 1.12, okay? I'll just go ahead and get the area real quick. I'm going to look up 1.12 with the normal CDF. Oops. Point eight six eight six four. All right, we'll come back to that now. We don't need that just yet because we got to get the other value. So we got to have that other z-score. The number always goes first that you're trying to find for, okay? The mean is always second. If you don't do that, then your sign will be wrong. 
Okay. You want this to be, if it's less than the mean, then it should be negative. If it's, if it's great, values greater than the mean, it should be positive. So this is negative eight, as I can see. I'll do it on the separately. And y'all tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. So this is a it's negative. It's needed to two. Okay. So I'm gonna look up the area to the left. Like I said, I'm doing it the boring old uh, almost old fashioned way, but it's the safe way. And then if I need that z-score to refer back to, I've got it. And this is going to be the smaller one because it's further to the left. It's a negative value. All right. So we're just going to now do a subtraction. And uh, if you were to somehow put in the small one first and subtract the big one, that's not a wasted calculation because you can just change the sign. But of course, it's probability, so it's always got to be positive. All right, what does that come out to? And that's not 39. That should, I'll come back and put a decimal there. That's why um, it's wise to put a zero in front, and that's why you see people using both. Because if you put a zero in front, sometimes if you don't put a zero there, you can uh, sometimes not see the decimal. So that's why that, that zero goes in front of a, um, something that's less than. Uh, one or something that's a partial. All right. So the area in between is point four seven five oh six.
to this a decimal there. All right. All right, any questions? We got kind of one more little thing to do before our break. That's essentially all of um, 6.1. Now, 6.2 is really pretty much the same thing. It's just that um, we got to take into something. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're not quite finished yet. I'm sorry. Let's check 6.1. I was hoping that we were, but we should be able to finish with this before the break, and then uh, we go back and we'll um, look at 6.2. All right, now, as I said earlier, one of the things that makes Chapter 6 kind of confusing is that you got to go forwards and backwards. That was the forward. So now, if we're given an area, then how do we find that z-score? Well, it's really pretty simple because there's a, a different function for that. You can also take the table and go and find. Let me just bring this problem back up here. All right, um, find the z-score when a given area of 0 0.1660 to the left, assuming a mean of zero. So the way it works is with the table, you can go in and uh, just look in the middle of the where all those values are at and then kind of work backwards. But on the calculator, there's a different function that I'll show you. It's called inverse norm. On uh, Excel, it might be norm inverse, but uh, every type of technology has this function. So now it's not the second one, it's the third one. And it's going to ask for something very, very similar, but I'm just going to leave the, the mean and the, and the standard deviation of one there. And the area that we wanted was. 0 0.1660 or 0 0.166. Now, since it said to the left, then I'm just going to put that in here. I don't have to worry about anything. And so what that means is there's the z-score. It's negative 0.97. All right. And we'll just kind of type it in here on this thing. I'll bring it back to the notes. Okay, so four to the left, that's all there is to it. Now, since we got the next one, it's a to the right, then we're still going to do the same thing, but we got to use the complement rule first, okay? We're going to convert it to the left.
Uh oh. Wasn't sharing. This is why I don't go back to the calculator every time if it's something routine because I'll forget to go back, you know. All right. So um, here was the problem. Find the z-score when given an area of, and it really helps to put that zero in front. Like I said, it's just because if the decimal is too small to see, yeah, that kind of shows you this there. Use the complement rule. One minus. So how much is that to the left? To the left. And then that's the value we're going to look up. Because this is the thing about the calculator, and this is why I say that the calculator is kind of screwy and you got to be um, careful about how much you let it do. And this is why the things that I show you are by hand, because one of the problems with this calculator is now, even though with normal CDF, you could have had it do to the right for you and you could have had it do between for you. When you get to the uh, inverse norm, it only does area to the left. There's no other choice. So I just want to get you in the habit of always doing this intermediate stuff by hand. So uh, 0.2296. And then I got, oops. So there's a the Z score that pertains to that. And then I'm just gonna round it off to two. It would round, you know. All right, let's do a couple more. There's two here, and then we'll take a break. All right. Now, you remember in Chapter th uh, 3, we talked a little bit about percentiles and related it to quartiles. The, each, the quartile, on first quartile is 25 percentile or the 25th percentile. The median is actually the 50th percentile and also the second quartile. And then the third quartile is the 75th percentile. Well, you don't need to know, remember all that, but just um, within the context uh, and another one of these, I guess I don't have enough memory to keep showing those. I can't remember what that was, but doesn't really matter. Now, we're going to go back to IQ scores and then work backwards. So we're going to still need to know that the IQ scores are normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Find the IQ scores with an area of 0 0.29, 0 0.97 to the left. And that was, is really the 97th percentile. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a problem similar to this in the notes. I'm sorry, in the PowerPoints and in the book, and I think it deals with Mensa, just saying that this is the uh, um, threshold for men Mensa. You got to be in the 97th percentile. All right. So what we're doing, and I'll do it one last time here, is I'm going to take, and I'm going to look that up using the inverse norm. Oh, I know what this was. I'll find another one, and I need to show you that. Well, I don't need to show it to you, but uh, but it, it would help. And I think they, they, they use this in the book and the notes. It's just that they uh, – 
you know, it's it's important to know why you're doing this. The formula, like I said, is you're not expected to derive this formula, but I'm just going to show you why it's here. Let me go ahead and share this. All right. Now, uh, you don't need to like do the algebra of this, but um, in order to calculate the z-score, you need to have three things. You need to have the x value, you need to have the mean, and you need to have the standard deviation. But if you're going backwards and you want to find a, an x value for the percentile or for any place on the, you know, any area, well, then you got to work backwards. In other words, you got to solve this thing for x. In other words, it helps to solve it for x. So in other words, you got to multiply both sides by sigma to get the one out of the bottom. And then that's a z, a, the z-score times the uh, standard deviation is x minus mu. And then you um, add mu over there. And this is what it looks like. Mu plus 2 times the standard, um, mu plus z times the standard deviation is equal to x. And then they just turn it around. So now... When you see this thing being used, that's what it is. It's just the z-score backwards. So now, if we want to find the 97th percentile, and like I said, I'm going to show you real quick. Probably the last time I'll show you with the count. Well, I'm going to show you something else with the calculator. But I'm just going to show you real briefly. Oops. I want to show that. I want to show the calculator. All right, so um, so we're just going to use the inverse norm, and and up here I'm going to put point nine seven, and now that z score is one point eight eight. So you can see how I've got it in the notes here. All right, so as I said, from technology, the z-score that pertains to the 97th percentile is 1.88. And remember, as I said, this when you get to, uh, you know, 0.95, you're starting to get pretty rare. All right, so now how do we find it? We're just simply going to put into this form. Remember, we're going to add the mean to z, which is this, that we just looked up, times the standard deviation of 15. So 100 plus 1.88, or 15 stand, uh, 1.8 standard deviations is 28.8 added to 100 is 128.2. So there's the value that separates the top 3% from the bottom 97%. You score above that. In other words, if you probably the IQ scores are probably going to be whole numbers. So if you went to 129 on your IQ score, then you would be in the, you know, top 3%. All right. So let's just look at these couple real quick and then we'll take a little break. Find the z-scores for the middle 95%. Now, I have another thing here, and maybe it's another. Yeah. Let's see what happens. I don't know why. And then if I put them back in there, they, let me just look for another one.
sometimes I can't find one that exactly fits what I would like, but here we go. This one is perfect. All right, so this visually showing you why the mat, what we're going to do first. All right, we're going to use the complement rule, but we got to we got to split something. All right, now if we're talking about the middle ninety five percent, that means there's five percent that's unaccounted for. All right, now in order for it to be the middle ninety five percent, that means point uh, you know two point five percent has got to be on one side and 2.5 on the other. Well, that's why they show you this, and they'll show you this in the books. This is what they call Z of alpha over two. Alpha is that funny looking little thing. And if I had enough time, I would put an alpha in there for you, but you kinda gotta do it by programming with latex in it. I don't know what the symbol is for that right offhand. Um, but we gotta take that missing 5%, Okay, so there's the missing 5%. That's what they call alpha. And like I said, it looks just sort of like a, um, I'm not even sure what that looks, what that say that it looks like. It's just the, uh, I'll put it over here. There we go. Just remember, we're dealing with decimals, but that's 5%. Alpha, two point five. Zero point zero two five. So half of that is two point five percent, and it's split up on either side. So that's what that represents over there in that visual. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we want to find out what this lower uh, boundary is. In other words, what's that Z score? for this one here, that one on the left side of the green and the right side of the green. Well, it's really really simple when you do that. So um, we're gonna just look up 0 0.025. So if I look up 0 0.025 with the calculator, again, I'm just doing it out of screen. You get, negative 1.96 when you round it off to two. All right, now here's where symmetry saves you some work. Now, just like the combo rule can save you some work. Uh, if you uh, wanna find the other boundary, then it's kind of confusing why you gotta do it. But if you take that 0 0.025 on the other side and add it to 0.95, or you use the complement rule and you subtract the 0 0.025 from one, then this one would give you the positive boundary. But the positive boundary is just gonna be opposite. The, the, uh, it's just gonna be the positive value. So the boundaries for the Z values or the Z value boundaries for the middle 95% is negative 1.96 and 1.96. So now we just do what we just did with the other things. Instead of calculating with 1.88, 
um, we do um, two of them. We do positive 1.296 times 15, and then that gives us 129.4, and then the other one gives us the uh, the lower one. And remember, that one's negative. The sign is important. So then what that's essentially saying is over here is the 70 or 71, we could just say, is right here. And over here is 129. So those two scores tell you what 95% of the folks are going to be in. Very small amount is going to be over here in this little bitty thing, and a very small amount is going to be over here on the right. All right, and this, this last little thing, this is just notation. When you see this Z of, and it's got the sub 0.1, on this, for example, that means to the right. Okay, so just notice that. That means then if you want to find the area to the left, you can look it up by subtracting from one. And so when you do that, you would look up 0.89 to find that value with the inverse norm. All right, let's take a little break. We'll come back just right around uh, 12.30, 12.35, and finish up this pumpkin, okay? If you got any questions, just pop them in there, and I'll... Thank you. All right. Uh, the last... Th uh, well, the last important thing... Well, the last thing that will knock you on your backside here <laughs> in Chapter 6 is the central limit theorem. And it's really not that bad. I remember when I first started uh, teaching statistics, I had already, you know, studied a few statistics courses in graduate school and such. And then I came back to this and it was like, oh, no, but I'll, I'll try to take you through the things that I've learned that make this easier. Now, up to this point, when we're talking about probability, we're always talking about going in and pulling out one item. We're talking about what is the proportion of those things. So if we go in and pull one item out, then that proportion stays true. That proportion goes over the probability that, you know, if 60% are men and 40% are women and everybody's got their name, you know, their gender written on a card and you, flip them, you know, stir them all up and you go in and pull one out, then we can say that proportionally and thus the probability of picking a man, you know, is point four, whereas picking a woman would be 0. 0.6. But we have to make a, 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 an error correction in this case here. Now, let's say instead of going in and pulling out one, we're going to go in and pull out a sample. Now, if we pull out a sample, then things change. We have to I'll take that right there and just make this a little bit simpler. Trying to make this as simple as possible. So if we're looking at a sample, in other words, we got an N now. Before, N was just one, actually. Then we got to make an error adjustment. And it's called the standard error. But the whole thing together is just referred to as the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem is just essentially that when we're uh, pulling out a sample and finding the probability of pulling out that sample. Now, just think about this. If you've got a proportion, you know, everything in a proportion, you go pull one item out, the probability is pretty simple. We've been dealing with that throughout. But if you go in and pull out a big handful, then things are going to change. The probability is not going to be the same as pulling out one. And what we use is this thing called the central limit theorem, limit theorem. And there's really just one thing you have to be worried about, okay? This right here, all this is just basically saying that for a sample being selected, this first one right here at the top is just the mean is the mean, all right? No changes. So if you've got information like the um, that... Um, data with the 
uh, IQ scores and we're going to go and pull in out six people and find out what the probability of them having a score greater than 119, then we can still use that mean of 100. But what we have to do is we got to make an adjustment to the standard deviation and it's called the standard error. So notice that on the second part of this theorem, that the standard, and that's all that means on the left-hand side, they got mu of X bar, that just means the sample um, mean, the mean of the sample mean, or the sample mean of the mean, whatever way you want to look at it, and the sample mean of the, um, the standard deviation of the sample is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And that right there is called the standard error. That caught, because you're using the sample size and then the denominator, you're going to create a smaller standard deviation based upon however big the sample size is. The larger the sample size is, then it's, it's going to um, make it smaller. If it's smaller, in other words, if that n were 1, then the, stam the standard deviation is going to say the same. But as it gets larger, that standard error is going to get smaller there. All right. And that's kind of on purpose because the larger the sample is, we kind of go back to, um, we can kind of, that allows us to err on the side of caution. But anyway, so just remember that. So we got an example here. And if you were to just do these with the, uh, without doing the sample um, standard, but without doing the standard error correction, then you're not going to get the right answer. As a matter of fact, last night I went through and did a problem in the uh, homework for this, and uh, it was like four or five different ones, you know, A, B, C, and D, and E, and I, you know, they didn't let me check my answer till the last. And then they pointed out one, and I said, oh, no, what did I do wrong? And I went back, and I had just put the standard deviation instead of the standard error in the z-score. All right. But everything is exactly the same. Now, these can be very tedious. All right. But we're going to go through it slowly here. And then, like, the last 10 minutes, we can look at assessing normality because that's really, you know, there's no real calculations to do on it, you know. It's just looking and seeing. All right, the population um, the, or the population mean annual salary for plumbers is $46,700, all right? We got a mean. A sample of 42 plumbers drawn from the population. Assume the standard deviation is 5,600. Now, here we have three bits of information, whereas before, you know, it would have said something like, what's the probability of pulling one person? But now we're talking about pulling out 42 of them. So we got to make that correction. So what is the probability that the mean of the sample is less than 44,000? All right, we're going to go over to the board and do that. And like I said, it's going to be kind of tedious, and uh, there is a way to do it on the calculator and put everything in, but then you got to have, uh, I said, almost a class and, you know, input on and that editor, because this it can get really uh, uh, crazy, you know, on doing those inputs on those calculators, or that editor thing. Got to have parentheses and all that. All right, so let's just put this information over here on the board. Put like a little text box, and I'll paste all this in here, and then we'll work away. But there's nothing else new here under that other than just we got to deal with the sample size. Everything else is still the same thing. 
All right. What is the probability that the mean of the sample of 42 is what they're talking about is less than 44,000? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the um, standard error thing over here separately. Um, So this is what we're going to calculate. We got to do this by taking this and divided by the square root of n. Are we writing too big here? So it was 5,600 Now, if you, like I said, if you put this in the calculator and you find the way to edit it right, then you could just put that in and it's an exact answer. But um, I'm going to want to get and give us an approximation for it. And you always got to remember, if it says round off to four decimal places, then go six out until you get to the end. Fifty six hundred divided by square root of forty two. It's approximately um so I'm gonna use approximation it's eight six four Point zero nine nine. All right, now that's what we're dealing with now. We never want to use that 5600 again unless we're asked specifically about one item or one individual. All right, so for this, what we got to do is calculate the z-score just like we've been doing. And then again, this is a less than, see, so whatever value we look up, you know, it's going to, we're going to get the area we need. We don't have to do any complement rule. But I need the z-score. And of course, the biggest mistake some other would make, and I told you I made it just because it's, it's the normal thing to do because you, you've come from just doing one to doing a sample. So you got to put this down here. And like I said, is if you're using the calculator, you got to use parentheses to get it in there right. So uh, what does this come out to? Let me go ahead and do it. I really stole. Don't. Uh... So 44. So this is negative 2,700. So um, so it comes out to negative 3.12. All right. All right. Now, once we got a z-score, we just proceed as uh, we have been. So let's just go back. I'll show you this this time. Because I think we're doing all right on the time, but uh, 
So now we're going back the uh, forward. So we're going to go to the normal CDF. And we're just going to put here the negative 3.12. And incidentally, if we had tried to use the inverse norm, I think if you try to put that in there, it's going to give you an error because remember, when you're dealing with inverse norm, it's always an area. So it's always going to be positive because it's a probability. With here, the uh, limit can be negative or positive. Now, this is going to be a very small value, actually. You got to remember your uh, how to translate your scientific notation. So we're going to say 0.30. All right. So here's the probability. Really small. Because as I had said, when you get outside of three standard deviations, you're getting into very rare territory. So that's why this is so small, especially with that sample of 42. So let me ask you this question here. Would this be an unusual occurrence? Same thing we've been talking about since chapter four, maybe we talked about in chapter three. Yes or no? Yes. That standard's always gonna be there. And when I showed you that a little bit earlier about that middle 95%, that's where that 5% is coming from. That's the missing 5%. When you're talking about 95%, that 5% is the unusual. Okay. And just be on the lookout. Now, if you were asked for just a normal individual, just one individual and not a sample, then you're gonna have um, a smaller Z value, okay? I mean, you know, cause it's gonna have just 5,600 down there. All right, let's look at uh, B. All right, so now it's a greater than. So, Holly, this is going to be when we count when we calculate. We're going to have to subtract from one. Once we count, get the value back, the area back, we've got to subtract from one because it's greater than. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm putting underlines under it too so I can remember. Okay. Well, we got to get the area first. You can only use that complement rule on an area because it's a probability. You don't use it on a Z value. So the confusing part is when you're doing it from um, area to Z score, you got to do it first. You got to um, you got to greater than. You got to subtract the the complement rule. You got to use the complement rule first. Whereas here, when you're going to the Z value, you don't do it until you get the area back. All right, so let's just go ahead and do this long process. Thankfully, we've already got this done, but I just wanted to show you how now instead of 5600, you're using 
So we're still doing the Z value the same old way. And then when we do that, well, we're going to divide by our um, standard error, they call it. And like I said, is if you're trying to get the calculator to do this, sometimes you got to use, you, well, almost always you got to get it to do parentheses. You got to use parentheses because if you just did 48,000 minus 46,700 and then you uh, divided, because that's what that fraction bar means, divided by, divided by 56 divided by 47, then what it does is it does all the divisions first and you don't want to do the division first. You want to do the subtraction first in the numerator, then whatever that division in the denominator is, the 864, then divides into. Like I said, the calculator can get very complicated, and so that's why I'm not going to just concentrate on using that. But like I said, next year we'd be doing using something else anyway, and. So this is 1300, positive now. All right, so uh, let me do the calculation here. Hold on a second. So this is one point five. And I'll just put a zero because, you know, we uh, generally the um, conventions round off to two. All right. So now this would be quite different if we had put uh, only the 5,600 down there. We're essentially dividing by that 864.1, okay? So that's resulting in a smaller Z score than if we weren't. I'm sorry, a larger Z score if we were. If you had just the uh, 864 down there, this is going to be um, a smaller Z score because 5600 goes uh, into there into that 1300 less than one, but 864 goes into there one and a half times essentially. All right, so now let's go to the calculator. And I'm going to use it to look up the uh, 1.5. And I'm going to write it on there when I get it. So it's 0 So about 93%, but and that's going to be like uh seven zero six six eight. 
so the answer is finally is 6.6 percent .6 about just to put it in perspective so of selecting 42 of them that have a salary greater than 48,000 there'd be about 66.6 percent all right the last one I guess we'll look at uh, just be on the lookout, like in in, in the problems, because when I, I can't remember if it was the one I worked or another one I looked at. Then uh, maybe C would be something like, uh, actually D would be something like uh, what I'm going to do next. C would be something like what I'm going to do next, and then the last one would be what would be the probability if only one individual was selected. So then you would go back to just doing the normal Z score and putting the 5600 in there, all right? So we got the same information. And now it's find the 75th percentile of the sample mean. Now, what's different about this is just that it's a backwards problem. All right. So what we're going to do is essentially what we did back over here. And I'll just refresh your memory. We were asked to define the 97th percentile, except now it's 75th. And what we got to do is look up the z-score, and then we use the backwards z formula with the z-value, the standard deviation that they've given us with the standard error adjustment and then the mean. This is the one I actually made a mistake on, I believe, when I did it online last night. I had to go back and correct it. But it's of the sample mean, okay? That's why we got to keep that. And I'll just write, write it over here. Remember, we got... I'll tell you what. So the uh, mean was forty six seven. And then N was 42. So we're using the same thing. Same information. I just want to make sure you knew that's the same thing if I head up here. All right. So now we got to find Okay. So now we're going back to the to the inverse norm. And I'm just going to put 0.75 there. And the good thing about this one and the good thing about if you do it the handle the way I showed you, I mean, you don't have to change anything. You don't really have to do anything. It just put in for the missing parameter, which in this case is the well, it was going to be area. So 
So that's about two thirds as far as area is concerned. So when you go up essentially uh, to the 75th percentile, that's the Z score that pertains to that 75th percentile. All right. So now we use our backwards Z formula. And that was, let's see, what is it? It's X is equal to mean plus standard deviation times Z score. See, we don't have X. We're looking for that X. And we got the mean and we got the standard deviation of the Z score. And actually, what I should put here is. Standard error, okay? Because we're not using the Z, we're not looking for an individual. So we got to, uh, and I'll just write up here, let's see the, um, remember it's 5,600. And we're just, I'm just going to use with 864, uh, what was it, 864 point, um, just make it simple for right now to make things quick. All right, now, so we're going to have X is equal to 46,700 plus... The standard error, and now I'm just going to write in this this time times the 0 0.67. Let me do that. Uh, it's going to be positive, and this is why this works because if you had a negative z score it would uh, end up subtracting. It'd be in the, a negative, so it would end up being a subtraction. So, um, So then what we get, X is equal to, and we're looking for a salary, so we're not going to round it. We're going to round to the tenths. Whoops, what happened? Something's not right. Oh, we got to add that to the plus. So this would be um, 46,700. And then that part ends up being uh, five. 78.95. So that would be 47,000. Two seventy eight point nine five. So forty seven thousand two hundred and seventy nine dollars for all intents and purposes um, would be the seventy fifth percentile of the sample mean. All right, questions. That's all of the basic hard calculations. 
like I said, is if you want to deal with the, um, the calculator for uh, taking some of these shortcuts, you can do that. But like I said, is the problem with there is um, it, it can just it, it can get tough to just jump into doing those calculations completely by hand. Like what I'll do is uh, I may do them by hand and then I'll do them with that calculator to make sure I'm right. But if I was going to use something, I'm, I'm first thing would be to go to a spreadsheet anyway but any questions because like I said is that's pretty much it for the um, the calculation stuff in chapter six all right so for um, as I had said the things I show you are essentially universal you can look at them And most any textbook will be the same thing. But there are some things that are peculiar to the, text, to the textbooks. And assessing normality, since you're going to be doing questions on there that uh, are, are um, you know, b based upon their principles, then I'm going to look at the um, 6.5 PowerPoints for this. And like I said, this is really pretty short. But 6.5 is assessing normality. And you remember in chapter 2 and 3, I maybe it was 3, maybe they didn't bring it up in 2, but you learned about those histograms in chapter 2, and then you looked at one that was approximately symmetric. Well, that essentially is, asse is assessing normality. And then when we do box plots in um, chapter 3, the last section, chapter 3, that was essentially, you can use a box plot to assess normality. You know, if it's more or less symmetric, same kind of thing on the box plot, then you can assume normality. Well, they're going to give you a couple of other methods, and I wouldn't worry about these if it weren't for the fact that um, they'll probably use some of these in the homework problems and, of course, in those quizzes. But they they use dot plots, which are to me kind of silly, but they're simple. It's a good thing. Thankfully, you won't have to create any of these. The box plots, you've already learned how to create them. So here you're just trying to look at them. Histograms, which are my favorite ones to use. You can also use stem and leaf, which is essentially very similar to a histogram or a frequency distribution. And something called uh, normal quantile plots. And all that is, is an, a quantile plot, is just it relates the z-score of particular values to um, the position in the data when it's sorted, and does it create a straight line? It's kind of neat. It's just a pain in the neck to do them. Now, just kind of remember, you're not trying to determine whether the population is exactly normal because there are very few populations that are exactly normal. We have to say, is it more or less symmetric? And remember it was approximately symmetric was the term they use. Now, assessing normality is more important for small samples than for large samples, meaning, and the reason being that um, if you're over 30 in your sample size, usually you don't have to worry about normality. Um, and this is when you'll be using it in chapter seven and probably eight. Is you have to look if you've got a small sample like under thirty, it ask it'll ask you to look at a box plot or some other kind of thing like a histogram and say, is this approximately normal? Because if it's not approximately normal, there's no sense in music moving forward. And this is the part three that kind of undoes everything that they're talking about is hard and fast rules don't work. But we're going to use kind of use their hard and fast rules because, you know, we're trying to get our answers right in this class. We want to have a match to them. Like I said, in real life, you've got a lot of leeway. If you know, if you were given a presentation, you know, you don't have to be exact. You can be as exact as you, you know, more or less as you want to be. All right, so we're going to reject normality if we got one of three things. If we got an outlier, a large degree of skewness, in other words, we got a tail and no head. 
And the sample, it has more than one mode or distinct mode, okay? If you got one of those, then we're going to um, reject normality. But if they all three of those are uh, uh, are taken care of, then we got normality. Now, the first one they use is a dot plot, which is basically what most people know how to do when they're graphing a, on a straight line. So what this is and how this is done, and thankfully we don't have to actually create any of these, even though this would be fairly simple. But you've got seven temperatures that were taken at a factory uh, of ovens that were set at 360 degrees, and evidently they've got a, a master thermometer, and they go in and check when the thing is set, when the therm when the thermostat on the stove is set to 360, what is the actual temperature inside? Well, you see it varies quite a bit. Not quite a bit, but none of them were exactly 360. Some of them less, some of them more. And so what can be done on this is just do a little dot plot. All right, and what the dot plot is, it goes below the lowest value. In other words, it starts at 350 because there's nothing below 350, and it goes up to 370. There's nothing above 370, and then it takes five unit increments throughout. So then they just put each one of those seven in the spot that's more or less where it would be at. And then you look at it. Is there anything out of character here? Is Do they have values that are uh, outliers? But more or less, you could fix this one very easily because um, for these values on the left, until you get up to this one, which is 363, I mean, they're all almost perfectly uniform. So you could fix this and make each one of those perfectly uniform by moving that 364 maybe over one and then going over to the second to the last one and moving it over a couple of units to 360 or one unit 366. Now that's just kind of my way of looking at it, but they're telling you right now, there's no skewness. There's no one or a point that's way, way out in the left field or right field. And uh, so we can treat this as approximately normal. Now they'll show you a bad one. See this one? This one is um, pulse rates at a health fair. And you got pulse rates in that data that I'm help letting you take the test with. And there, um, I can't remember if there's something if we're using that in any of the calculations, but pulse rates are generally normally distributed. But look at this guy. I mean, this most of them are in the 60s and 70s, but you got a 98 in there. So somebody is either having a heart attack or they went for a you know, a, a, you know, a 7K run before they came and had their pulse taken, because that's pretty high. So because of that exist the existence of that outlier, then they reject normality. Now, uh, box plots are getting more to be what's something that's a little bit more useful for to do it. But they create a, a box plot here for 20 estimates for cars that were damaged at a, you know, in a place where they fix them, collision specialist. So they draw the thing out. Um, the whiskers, which are those lines that come off on the end, those are not the exact same size. If it were perfect, then you would have, have a shorter one on the left and a longer one on the right, or you would, uh, you know, they would just both be the same size for a perfect one. But remember, there's nothing perfect in the real world. Also, you remember this line in the middle? This represents the... Um, the median or the second quartile, and then the one all the way to the left is the first quartile, the one all the right is the a third quartile. So if you pull that little median over some to where it was right in the middle, and you stretch that one um, whisker on the right, this would be perfect. But, you know, there's no outliers on here. You remember what's the sign of an outlier? It was an X. So there's no X, so there's no outliers here. And uh, 
if it were skewed, there would be a real long tail in one place or another. All right. Now, here's one that's also, oops, that's not it. There we go. Now, here's something that deals with the number of uh, pounds or cubic feet of recyclable, recycled newspaper that came in every week. And this is like 18 weeks. And what you'll notice, if you kind of look at it, most of the values are in two or 3,000. And you have one here that's like close to 5,000. So draw using the dock plot, remember your upper and lower boundaries. Don't forget about that. Then that's an outlier, that 48,000. And strictly based upon the existence of an outlier, we would reject this. Also, there is skewness, too, to that right side, which is probably created because of that outlier. So reject normality. Histograms, my favorite way of doing it. And again, you don't have anything perfect. But uh, this is uh, the diameter of uh, eggs, 20 eggs. And you'll just notice that, okay, on the first one, the 56-inch one, it occurs more frequently, okay? But other than that, that thing more or less goes up and it comes back down. Uh, so, I mean, if you wanted to think about how many steps would it take to kind of fix this and make it pretty close to being symmetric, well, if you cut off the top two-thirds of that first bar, the 56, and stuck it in the 57, and then you flip-flop the 40, the 62, and the 63, this would be very close to perfect. But this is what they're calling normal, so pay attention when you see this kind of thing. They consider that more or less normal. And I think it's probably pretty safe to say the same thing in most cases. This one is one that deals with um, wear on people's shoe soles with a new type of shoe material. And you'll notice that this thing has a tail all the way to the right. So they're skewed to the right. Now, you can have a certain degree of skewness, but when you skew and you have no more head, and like I said, I don't know why I like to think about this because I never really pulled a, t a cat's tail in meanness or anything like that because I got pet cats. But I kind of think if you took a cat and you yanked its tail and all of its other um, bodily parts went in that direction to where there was, the head was you know, engulfed into the body kind of thing, that's the way I kind of think of it. I don't know why I like to think of it like that. But there's, the head is gone. And there's only a very, very long tail. You know, you kind of think it like something in these old cartoons before they started taking out all the violent looking stuff. But anyway, that's skewed to the right. So we would reject normality. And the, the dot plot is pretty much just like a histogram. You just kind of have to flip it 90 degrees so that the the first column there, the left column, would be laying down. And you can kind of see how it goes, starts out low, comes up high, and comes back down. All right? So that's got a more or less normal distribution to it. And it follows the same pattern as the histogram. You use the same basic um, things. If it's skewed, you know, like this, you would be able to see the tail. And there's no tail on that. It's got two tails, like a normal cat, evidently. I don't I mean, like I said, it's, that was just one analogy I was thinking about. It's not perfect. And then also quantile plots, which is the last one. Um, here's just a sample of five. And they show you how to do these quantiles, but it's a lot of steps. If you ever need to actually calculate one, I've got a, I know where there's a site where you can just paste your data in there and it'll create it for you. But anyway, it's several steps. And basically what you end up doing is you sort them and then you plot You 
Now, I, I, I actually apologize about that. Hold on a second. What you essentially do is you take each of the values and you equally space them throughout. And then you calculate the Z score for them. And if it makes a straight line, more or less, and there's not going to be any perfect straight line, then we can say it's normal. And that one is more or less normal. And they even do one with the calculator, which it does do. And this one, um, not normal. Oh, uh, this is just my, you know, you're not going to see any questions on this, but it could help you, especially if you wanted to have a shortcut on the, you know, like on the test. If the um, mean, median, and mode are, are close, more or less the same, they'll never be perfectly equal. But if they're equal, then, or the closer they are equal, then you got normal distribution. Because if you got skewed data, remember, the mean and the me uh, median will be pulled apart from one another, and then the mode could be in any. All right, so uh, that's enough. Thanks for your patience. I was afraid I was going to not be able to finish this, but we got hit right on time. I mean, we hit right on time. I was last night when I did this in the other class. I said I was felt like I was behind the whole time, and then. I finished early and with you. I just finished right on time, but stick I'll stick around for a few minutes. If you got anything, anything you want to talk about, let me know. I never did see uh, Megan or... Uh, I don't think I saw Brittany Sampson either. Oh, and I, you know, and of course, hope you know, I put in the midterm grades. I'm not sure you can see when you can see them, but probably you can see them now in Lola. So if you would have known how we graded you, if we were at the end of the semester on the 30th. So on uh, Tuesday, we'll look at uh, and finish Chapter 7. Chapter 7 has only got three sections in it, so um, it should go pretty quickly. I mean, we should be able to 